the kind of um, thank you, Cynthia, the kinds of things that I would um, really enjoy doing is having someone poke at me and say, how do you do that? Or what is that? Show me that a little bit more closely. Because just for example, um, you know, it's one thing, it's one thing to see what's on Instagram and it's another for me to actually hold and flex and show you, I'm not gonna do it yet, so don't lean in, um, show you the objects because the objects, as we all know, when we work with materials, the objects have their own reality. They push back, they don't let you do certain things. Um, and I'm interested in, in um, pressing the materials. So I'm just gonna try to show you some stuff and then um, entertain questions and we'll see how the conversation develops. So um, first, uh, I just wanna thank Aaron, who's not here, but still, thank Aaron for reaching out to me back in February um, for, um, to invite me to come and, and, and chat with y'all. And I wanna thank Cynthia for handling all of the admin, um, being in touch with me and getting a Zoom together. Thanks, Cynthia, for that. Um, my name is John Muse, uh, I write I make films. I teach visual studies at Haverford College, which is a small liberal arts school just outside of Philadelphia, PA. You may have heard of Villanova. You likely heard of Villanova. You may have heard of Bryn Mawr. Haverford and Bryn Mawr are um, in a bi-college relationship. Someone has their speaker on, and I'm hearing a little bit of chat. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, I've been here since 2007, came from the West Coast. I'm speaking to you from my fierce and tiny studio, which is on the Haverford campus, which I um, fought for for a few years and finally got in 2019. It's a windowless room that used to be the changing room for referees at um, sporting events at Haverford. So yay to me or something. Uh, uh, and I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to talk to you about my paintings and cut paper pieces. Um, I wanna introduce myself briefly, show you the works that I've been creating and demo a few techniques, <clears throat> and then answer questions if there are any. And since I've all of my gear around me, please don't hesitate to ask about techniques or share thoughts or ideas. I mean, every literally everything that I have is within arm's, arm's reach. I may have to stand up, but probably not so likely. Um, I assume that we're all makers, or I know that we're all makers here, and that we've all figured out a few things that make us happy. Um, and to pick on the, up on the conversation with Ellen, we are all on the way towards making things that we want to see and that we think others have to see. And that's why we do what we do. I need to see this, others should see it too. Seeing it has been transformative, seeing it, making it and seeing it has been transformative to me. Um, I'm always hoping that seeing the things that I've made would be transformative to others. Um, and yet we're all stuck in certain kinds of ways um, with habits and with ways of working. And I hope if nothing else, I will have um, maybe broken some, help break some habits. And I'm hoping that y'all will help me break some of my own habits, the ones that get in the way of me flourishing or continuing to move forward. Um, let me say this is a rare opportunity for me. Uh, I have um, had the occasion um, to talk about the films that I've made and the scholarship that I've done here as a, um, as a professor, but I have, this is the first time anyone has asked me um, to talk about the drawings and paintings. It's just, it, which is interesting. We could, that would be a topic, like why would that be the case? Um, and yet I've also been doing it for a very long time probably um, as long, like since the 80s, uh, I have been, I started as a photographer um, and I've been drawing and painting since the 1980s with more or less intensity and only probably since 2019 and 2020 have I been doing it with more intensity. I'm gonna share my screen um, just to sort of give you a sense of um, a few ways of finding the kinds of things that I, do um, I have a I have a linked um, a link tree which uh, I appreciate I've ma I've worked on it pretty hard um, it has a lot of material in it so um, one place that I would um, ask you to visit is the portfolio site that um, that my um, uh, 
art partner, collaborator, Gene C. Finley and I have put together over many years. It includes um, much of the work that I'm gonna sh show you and some other um, uh, works as well, uh, all gathered in one place. So for example, on the, the, the works on paper material are, is gonna include drawings and paintings from the 90s as well as um, the work that is currently visible um, on Instagram. The other parts of the link tree that might be um, uh, of interest to you would be the, um, the film work, uh, which is when I introduce myself, typically I introduce myself as a filmmaker. That's kind of the, the work that I do that's my bread and butter. It's the kind of thing that I teach. I teach uh, film production. I teach uh, aesthetic theory and philosophy around both film and conceptually based art practices. Uh, I'm, I'm try to be all over that space. I've had a really productive year when I was on sabbatical, my first sabbatical um, in 2019, 2020. So this is, it's a, it's a decent place to start if you um, want to take a look at the kinds of things that I do. And if you really want to deep dive and see the kinds of stuff I care about, <laughs> then, then I, I, I don't know how many of you Pinterest, but, but the kind of work that I look at and care about and love is going to be here. And I find, I visit this, act, I actually visit this often whenever I'm stuck or whenever I'm like thinking, what, what do I, what do I like? What, what moves me? There are lots of work that, that I just am not done thinking about and looking at. Um, but we all have that. So I'm not going to embarrass myself by talking about it anymore. Um, we all have the, our special places and special things we look at. So there's that. So take your time, explore that. Um, so I'm here because in February, Aaron reached out to me. And Aaron reached out to me from seeing my Instagram. And I'm gonna go there for a moment because what, what's interesting, I think, I don't know for, I don't know what y'all do on, Insta on Instagram, but I tend to post things completely out of order, chronologically. There is work from like yesterday or this past week that's mixed with work from 2015. Um, there are um, pages devoted to recent film works. There's something from the 90s, which um, is a small painting that was in a, um, in a book where I painted on every page of, of this um, uh, book of philosophy. Uh, and just kept working that way for as long as I, page by page by page by page, as long as I could. So there's a lot of material that is in the um, Instagram. I'm happy to walk through some of these. I'm gonna, I've chosen some things to look at myself. Um, there's some things that I'm like, I still go back to because I feel like I've made some kind of discovery that I need to follow through on, but haven't quite figured out how to follow through on it. Um, which in the case of this particular image is the way, and this is something I will maybe talk about when I try to demo something, which is the way that, that the cuts through this arc of paint allow for something both in, in this space. You can see my arrow. Can you not? Cynthia, will you nod? If you, yeah, thank you. Um, as well as this space. And if you just stare at this for a minute and ask yourself spatially, how it's working, what's on top and what's on bottom. I hope that it's a little hard to determine what's on top and what's on bottom. Um, and it's a lot simpler than it looks in terms of the way that this weaving is going. Um, so there, what I one thing I appreciate about the Instagram is that I have to keep looking at it in order to remind myself that there is unfinished business. And that's just the way that I work. I look at this and think, yeah, there's a little, you know, I haven't really gone further with this. I need to go farther with this. This is something that I haven't come back to. So Instagram is not just a way for me um, and nor is the Pinterest of um, putting things in a certain order. They're a way for me to surprise myself by things that I've made. Like I like being surprised by, um, by works that, that maybe I didn't think about 
I'm, I'm sure this has happened to all of you. You pull something out that may be a few years old, you're surprised, you think, wow, that's really good. I was good then, now I'm an idiot. What happened to me? This was so good back then. What, what, what's still there as a resource for me to pick up and keep working on? So there's a lot of that. That's the, kind of the way that I engage with, with Instagram. Um, I want to take an opportunity to show um, some older things, some older work that got me here um, from the 1990s, which is very, I'm going to say different but that's probably a lie. It's probably to you will look all the same and be curious. But this work <clears throat> from the 1990s um, is tissue paper and ink. I work on the front of the tissue paper, the black lines. I work on the back of the tissue paper, the white paint, so that I can create opacity. And I do cutouts. I do multiple layers. There are probably five layers of paper here, all layered with um, acrylic gel medium. And then, like, I don't care about things like um, bends in the paper and puckering. That just becomes part of the way these things are layered. And I work this way a lot. Here, this is there's um, stitching. There's a there was a, a bad sewing machine involved in the making of this. Um, as well as layers of tissue paper, ink, and, and um, uh, it's probably acrylic, titanium white on the back of tissue paper to create opacity, et cetera. Um, some collage work, some simple, really simple um, ink drawings, which are just ink on tissue paper or ink on vellum. Um, some ink and paint on the pages of books so this is all this is all work from the 1990s that one collage probably not this is from the I don't know why this is in there it's from the 2010s so, but these are earlier um, just sharpie and white paint put down sharpie then go over with white paint then more sharpie etc um, hole punch paper a drawing underneath right so um, and probably no, probably glue that's tacking this at the corners, right? So it's cheating. Here's one of the, those works on paper that where the yes glue begins to brown. And the reason that you can see it is because it's under tissue paper. So this is um, ink, tissue paper folded so that we get this mirror image of this tower-like shape with a little bit of a Rorschach uh, image, um, five, maybe four or five layers of tissue paper with ink drawings on them, and maybe in the middle here a little bit of white, a little bit of white paint behind. Um, so this would this would all be older work. This is work that that I was doing again and barely finding a way to push out into the world. Um, the one uh, I will say that the that I was able um, because of a um, a friendship able to convince um, um, one of my teachers to, I'm going to share the screen again, hope it's not dizzying and I'm going back and forth, um, from the same period uh, to pick up one of these drawings. Um, and there's a nice story behind this. So in the 1990s, I made this image, again with layered layered tissue paper. This is probably five or six layers of tissue paper. Again, working on the front of the tissue paper with ink and on the back with white paint in order to create opacity between layers. It's like, it's as though I didn't know Photoshop was a thing and I was just creating layers of, of, of stacking images, analog images. Um, and uh, this is, an, this is a, a stencil, not a stencil, a silhouette of Abraham and Isaac from a children's book, children's Bible, um, introduction of illustrated Bible that I then I stenciled and used as an image. <clears throat> and my um, teacher uh, used it for the cover of a book. That was a nice day when that request came in. Um, but what's funny about this as a story is that, um, let me reload this. 
Oh, it didn't get saved. Did it not get saved? Hold on one second. You should be seeing something else here. <gasps> I didn't save it. So let's try to find Abraham and Isaac JPEG. Card recto. And card Abraham. Give me a sec. Sorry for the delay. Verso. And let's do um, a different share. Stop share. Share. Desktop. You know, you're going to see everything. So what she saw was a postcard, because I wrote her a postcard. I built a postcard with this image. And, um, you know, and it was just a cheeky, stupid, fun thing that I did. Can you see? Yeah, you can see both of these. Um, and I used this as a postcard uh, for to write to my friends and family, et cetera, back when people wrote folding cards. So I would fold it. Um, at the line here and address it and write a note. <clears throat> and when she saw this and liked it, I then like spent a month trying to make something like it because I was foolishly thought she wanted something like it, but she really just wanted this. And so I generated dozens of other Abraham and Isaac images that were, of course, not at all what she wanted. Um, so that work, it went, it went somewhere, um, but it's just been part of my practice to make this stuff. Um, I'm gonna show you now some of my journal images, unless there are any burning questions that I need to answer right now. Anybody have anything from what, what I've already shown you that you would like me to talk about at all? And if not, that's fine. Just just so you know, Aaron has been in contact with us and he is tied up waiting for a delayed flight. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was right. traveling. So that's why he's not on the call. So um, beginning maybe in 2012, 2015, I began to do what, you know, we were talking about earlier. So this is 2013. Um, just doing a journal that I would make, I mean, and now we can really see in a way that when, I, when we're looking at, at scans, we can't see. Like you can see the different layers because you can see the different reflectivity of the, of the paper. You know, you can really tell what's on top and what's on bottom here. But my, my concerns are typically with confusing um, the space in ways that are, are delightful, enigmatic where knowing what's on front and what's on uh, what's in front, what's in what's behind becomes a problem, especially when there are little representations of space where you can sort of see a little bit of a receding space in this floor that's going back and trying to exploit the way that perception and this um, floor wants to um, recede into the background, but then doing work on top of it that pulls it forward. And these just become little problems to not so much solve, but to play with. And if I, again, if I show you what's on top and what's on bottom by bringing it up close enough so that you can see, you know, you can see the, the, um, the, the, the floor images on top, and on top of that are these small drawings um, on another surface. Though when I look at it, um, it goes back and forth, sometimes the, the what's in this triangle recedes spatially. I just broke it, which is why I shouldn't touch my stuff and why it's not glued down. So this isn't glued, right? It's glued down at the, at the corners. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I still like looking at here. I started working with paint and inks and wanting to smear that paint and smear that ink and then wanting to use the, the um, edges of those paint marks. I'm going to try to find one as a contour to cut on. Like here, using the contour of the drawing of the to as a cut line, which when you look at it closely, you can see how that's working. So I began to think about how, um, let me pull this a little closer, how the marks that you make with pen and with a squeegee can turn into 
um, cut lines for collage. So if I am looking at this uh, moving across this one little bit of ink, that smear of ink going there, and there's a smear of ink coming down vertically, then I align this paper edge, which you can see is a separate piece of paper. I align that paper edge with this edge, and now I've created the, the illusion of a certain transparency, right? So I began to think about transparency as something I could play with by simply layering materials so that um, this appears to be woven, but there's no weaving. They're simply cutting, cutting the, these um, blue pieces, which I've cut to mimic the, the pass of this, what is that object? That's essentially this. Do you all have one of these? <laughs> you don't have one of these? These are so great, right? They're just really nice way of making, let's see if I ruin something, a really nice way of making a saturated um, line where the, where the, um, let me do another one. Yeah, okay. Where the streaking becomes, like if I were gonna work on this, I would then cut this out and I would pick that up and use it, which is exactly what I do here. Right. This is me just stopping to talk about the work that I'm showing you. Um, sometimes I'm into this, you know, like even just simply allowing this cut piece to butt up against this edge as opposed to this edge, which is the real edge of the paper, creates a different spatial relationship. So I'm always, I'm always looking for ways to um, let cut edges do something more than simply define a different space. I want those cut edges to create um, a particular kind of optical effect or uh, an illusion. Yeah. Right, you know, so you all know now, I think you'd all tell me what's going on here. It looks like there's a line that's over top of the red smear, but that's not what's going on. I've cut this to match the, to match it, right? So um, these games may not be of interest to anyone else, but they're really interesting to me because they create things I want to see. And I'm hoping that others can delight in seeing the things that I want to see. Um, that's always like a, a goal. But you know, some of this stuff, it's in a journal. So like, I would work on two or three pages at the same time. Sometimes I would just make drawings and then decide not to touch those drawings because I wanted to remember them. Here's another one where there's the sense that these pink lines are on top of the shape of this hair, but of course that's not what's going on. It's not the way it was made. It's nice for me to go through this because see, I'm seeing things that, like this smear of paint gets to be cut out. Like that's, that's a cut, but it looks like, it looks like a, uh, like a smear of paint across. And the, the, this object underneath looks like it joins up with this object, which is on top. So I'm always thrilled when I can see these strange, um, continuities that I've created that aren't there. I've created them. Um, this, what looks like a, a, the strap of a purse has nothing to do with this ring, but because of the way they've been layered, it looks like one object that is more or less obscured. And that's, that's the kind of thing that excites me in, in working through these. Here, this is, this, I, I just, I'm take the opportunity to say, Every time I see this, I get really excited, and I don't think I've done anything else like it. And that's one of those mysteries that, uh, and the, that I'm not telling you to be excited about it or to, or anything. It's just, as artists, I'm really 
interested in those moments when there, we've done something once and every time we go back to it, we're a little excited, but we don't know how to follow it up. Like, what would it look like? What would it look like for me to keep doing that? And I could never figure that out. It's not just, it's not just drawing concentric circles again and working, working on top of that. It's something else, and I just don't know what that is. Um, and that's, you know, that's exciting. Here's, you know, a case where I wanted to treat this smear as an object, and pull it out. And that's because I did it on one sheet of paper, cut it out, and put it on top of something else. And you know, I love that the this these are um, there was a whole like m set of months where I just wanted to work with um, mailing labels. I get a sheet sheet of mailing labels and do painting on top of them, and then rearrange them, right, so that they're not, so that they don't line up anymore. And I got really excited about that for a while. Like, you know, you can tell. I haven't done it since, because I don't think it really took me very far. But I kind of, you know, there's some rhythmic elements. I kind of want to see that. It's very bacony, as in bacon, as in I'm hungry. Um, okay, I could keep going th through this. Uh, most of this imagery is, uh, is, is on the Instagram. It's just not in order. And we were looking at stuff from 2013. So this is nine years ago. Um, and now I want to move to um, some of the more recent things. Uh, and this is the, that was all what I would call the glue period. And now I'm going to show you some things from the, um, uh, from the post glue period. Um, and I want to compare, let, let's say, you know, these are no longer a journal. And maybe this will make Ellen happy because none of this is magazine stuff. This is all, a, this is a series of paintings that all have all been cut apart and turned into a, a single object. Um, just for the sake of, um, let's see, I'm gonna stop the share for a moment and so I can do a comparison um, because this is something to think about when you're doing um, for your Instagram. So I'm going to start the share again, and this time I want to show the desktop share, and I want to show you not that one. All right, so there's that, and there's this. Okay. All right, so on the right, I'm going to try to put, scale them the same. On the right, stop it. On the right, you see the scan, and on the left, you see the object. Now, if I show you elements of this, if I even just turn it in the light, you'll see that there are col there's color and sheen that's in the object that's not really available in the scan. And that's because I use a lot of golds and silvers in my paints. Um, and you'll also see that there's a gloss matte distinction that also gets lost. Um, and you'll also see a lot of the textures um, and the, a lot of the cutting like if you look at the way this band has been cut, brought forward so that this yellow to orange shape can be inserted under that band, and yet that band is truly behind, but I've cut it so that it comes forward. Like that in, in, the, um, in the scan, you're not really gonna see that. So, so the question is that maybe some of you are asking now, all right, well, if there's no glue in this, what are you doing? So this is, there's no glue in this, I'll just say that. This is um, all made using, um, using a material that is a transfer, essentially for mount, it's mounting paper that has silicone on one side and it's paper on the other. And when you apply it to the back of something, like this draw, the, this paint, small painting, you then peel it off. And now you have the silicone attached to the paper. Some papers, especially um, actual paper, like this is, 
I use a heavyweight. I only ever use a heavyweight paper. Card, it's almost cardstock. It's not quite cardstock because I want it to be absolutely opaque when I layer it, and I want it to hold up when I cut it. Um, and so on this object, all of the, how many layers do I have here? One, two, three. Each one of these layers um, is backed by this silicone. Um, and I use an iron to fuse that silicone to this paper. And you're saying, OK, well, John, well, so it's just glue. You're just going to heat it up and use it. This is true. I'm just going to heat it up. Um, I've already cut this. I'm doing my um, Julia Child moment here, where I prep this in advance for you. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of weaving, and I'm going to fuse it. So the nice thing, I'm sure you've all had this experience, the nice thing about um, uh, The nice thing about this material, unlike what I do with glue, is that with this material, you can futz around with it for as long as you'd like without ever having to worry about releasing it. Like if, if, I, if I now, like, I can sit here and futz with this forever, and when I finally want to um, glue it, I'm going to do this on some layers of paper just so you can see it happen. This is a stack of the released back backings, which I keep so that I can um, fuse. I'm going to fuse this. I'm going to do another cut and show you the kind of stuff weaving that I do. Should I put that in the background? I should probably put that in the background. Let's do that. So none of this is tacky. OK, it may be tacky to look at. You may think it's so tacky. Um, but none of it's sticky. That's a little bit better. That's kind of cooler. Let's move that over there. So some of that's out. And I'm going to line up, just because it makes me happy, this line inside of the drawing with the edge of this loop, which is a painted loop that I cut out. And I'm going to put this on top of here. I'm going to bring up my iron. I shouldn't be doing it on this surface, but it seems because I have another surface that I do this on. Um, I shouldn't do it on this surface because this surface isn't really made to withstand the heat. Okay. So once it cools, it cools really quickly. Right? So one thing you can't do with glue is continue to work quickly. Like you have to let the glue dry. I don't have to let this do anything but cool. And then you all get to see me do what maybe m many of you do too when you want to cut something, um, which is, let's get a different color. What do I want to do here? OK, we'll do these. This will be fun. I put on my second pair of glasses because that's the only way I can see things up close. So oh, um, since 2020, this is how many blades I've been through, right? I mean, we, I, I feel like I'm single-handedly keeping Exacto in, in business because I'm using so many of their number nines that um, I have a mason jar full. So let's do, let's do this. I have one more step to do with this, though, which will be boring. All right, so, and note, it's all like, it's all like stuck together, which is great. But now, um, in order to do the thing I'm about to do, I have to trim a little bit out of the middle of this, because if I don't, this won't work. So forgive me for the time slot. Someone asked me a question. John, John, someone someone was wondering about the um, oh, the transfer chat. paper. Do you, can, do you know the brand of offhand? Of course. Let me. Um, am I still sharing? 
Am I still sharing the desktop, Vicky? You can see the desktop? Yeah. So I buy everything from Blue Heron Arts, um, and I am probably the chief a user of this silicone mounting paper, and I buy it by the roll. Um, if you don't buy a lot of it, you're going to feel like guilty about using it. Um, don't feel guilty, just use it. Um, and I will put that in the chat. Oh, there are lots of questions in the chat. I haven't been noticing. Um, I got I got the chat, dude. Yeah, so there it is. Oh, you're monitoring the chat. Thanks, Vix. No, I mean, I got I never mind. You got it. I, you see it. Okay. Um, so yeah, this this stuff. What did I pursue? It was weird. I pursued a, 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 um, a clue. Someone just said, oh, you should use um, heat mounting paper. Because I was trying to find a way to not use glue. I was really done. Like, for example, um, I, want you to, I want you to think about what it would take and how good you would have to be to, because what I would, what I used to do if I wanted to put these two layers together, is I would coat the bottom with something really wet. It'd be like acrylic medium, and then I would lay down the top, and I would continue pressing and moving, and and it would never get flat enough, and it would never finally, um, uh, uh, and it would bend. It would just, it would just never get the results that I wanted. And so once I discovered the mounting paper, I could do really complex. So for example, you know, here's something, all of these layers have been fused. <clears throat> um, this, this layer started as a drawing that looks like something like this. I will cut this so that it looks like this like a line drawing in space. Um, I can use a use a, a hole punch, which is for leather, actually, but I use it for paper, which comes in all of these sizes. I mostly tend to work really big because I want the big pieces. And then I can, this will go to through two or three layers of paper if I stack them up. So I, so rookie error, you always put the mounting paper on the material first <laughs> because you do not want to be cutting out small holes in stuff after you've put the mounting paper on. You put the mounting paper over the, on the eight and a half by 11 or the 11 by 17, you just, you just do all of it and then you start to cut. Um, and once you start to cut, you realize that unlike with glue, where you have to worry about very fine detail, like this, I mean, imagining, imagine trying to only get the glue on this surface or imagine coating the surface with a glue or with an acrylic medium and laying this on. Um, if you lay it on, you're just gonna have to commit to that acrylic look. But what I, have, to that, to what, what var that look of varnish where you just keep varnishing the, the surface. And what I've been enjoying um, recently is playing with matte surfaces, like let, really letting the matte surface of these objects come forward. You know, I want, the, I want that, the, the changes in texture, where if I were to varnish everything, then I lose those changes in texture. So, um, you get detail, you get the chance to futz around with the materials, you get to try and try again, uh, you get to build layers in ways that I find to be, you know, unique. Like I, 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 I don't know any other way to do the things that I'm doing. It doesn't mean that there aren't other ways. I tend to be um, pretty myopic once I've discovered a way of working. I just want to keep plowing that same field. I just want to stay right there doing this, that one thing. Um, maybe I'll change in scale, you know, like something like this, which is upside down. 
um, you know, which emerged slowly over many, many days. But I feel like I get to make the kinds of things now that I wasn't able to make when I was only working in glue and the kind of thing that just happened when I was going through the journal and something tore. Like, that doesn't happen anymore because everything is uniformly, uniformly um, attached. Yeah, I'm, re I'm kind of still excited about this. This is only a few days old. There was a reel on in Instagram where I was trying to think through continuing to make this more complex, and I'm glad I did, especially up in here. I was going to demo, like, I don't know if you can tell looking at this, but to, this is the, this is the back, the, the, the back layer, and this is in front of this back layer, but only when it crosses over the red lines, which is only achievable by cutting the background out and, in, and laying it over top of that other surface that's going on here too. Um, yeah, I get excited about this. Is, this is, makes me happy. I've lost that other piece of material that I was going to show you, but I'm not sure it's that important. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that's, that I need to be able to, need to show you. I'm happy to show a lot of stuff because I have piles of stuff around me. Um, but I'd be happy to pick up on any other threads, anything you want me to, to talk about. I'd be happy to do that. Um, I also don't want to waste anyone's time. So if that's really all we need to to do, then I'm happy to um, to call it a, call it an evening. Well, John, I think um, I think we're all fascinated about this mounting paper. Most of us have never heard of this. Yes. Um, is, can Same can thing. you just show us one more time just the elements and how you went about attaching it? Sure. Because once um, once you iron it, everything is fused, right? I mean. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so here's the piece I was starting with, right? Um, and if you look at it, once I iron it, the loop, the loop that I wove through some of these bands, you saw that I cut the bands out, right? And you see that all of this is coated with that silicone, which was put on there through the transfer process. So, you know, when I start, when I start working, here's my roll. It's really big. And I've gone through two of these. I mean, I, I, I used to buy it in small rolls, and then I just committed, and I bought, like, just sell me as much as you can. And I spent all of my money. It's like 250 bucks, I think, on this, on this roll. But you know, like when you get enough of something, you feel like it's endless? And that's the feeling you need to have about it. You need to feel like you've got so much that you'll never run out, so that you'll experiment. Right, I am probably making a terrible error by not making Julie Marutu sized 12 foot by eight foot th like things. I, I'm like, I wanna put on my two pairs of glasses and I wanna work really close because that just makes me happy. Um, but these, you know, this new piece is kind of as big as I've been able to work. This is, this is you know, mounted. This is I'm working on that with a with a quasi 110 pound paper, very opaque. You can never see through it. I make paintings, which I could I could show you. But um, just to come back to the topic, um, once I do, once I've done this, then anything, then I can follow it up with anything. All of these little little circles have been punched out of and so they're all they're all also coated with the with the silicone right they've been punched out of another piece of paper and so I can come in here and I can do um, if you'll, on the Instagram you'll see lots of pieces where I essentially put do just a whole row down down a cut uh, the seam of a cut um, and I was going to, if I can find that little circle, which I spent some time cutting, 
that's what I was going to do with this. The reason I cut around it was so I could I could do this little this little thing right here. Ooh, that would be cool. I could just do that. All right. I wasn't going to do that, but now I'm going to do that. I have to make an adjustment. off so I have to power it up. <clears throat> so back in the day when I used glue in my glue stick I would be constantly wetting um, the side of a piece of paper sliding it under a piece like this and gluing it and trying to keep any waste and excess glue off um, and then knowing that I couldn't move it once I'd done that or couldn't replace it. Um, but with this technique, and I mean, one of the benefit is that um, when you've ironed on the, with small pieces in particular, with small pieces in particular, you can always move things slightly once the while they're still hot. So there's that. So it's now as flat as it can be. And I, if I were to keep working on this, if I were to keep working on this, I would have to probably change colors to do something. I put another layer in. Um, I still have some cut lines that are available for weaving. I might weave something else in. I mean, I can just keep going, and what, what I appreciate about it is it lets me work really quickly, because I'm not waiting for the glue. It lets me reposition everything while I'm working, um, and it uh, provides, I don't know what, it just gives me the ability to, to um, have a, a, a surface that I want to have instead of a surface dictated by um, varnish. John, I, I want to know what the next step. In other words, how do you mount these for showing or for selling? Do you ever frame them? Do you mat them? What do you do? So um, I've never matted or framed any of them myself. I've sold a few of these. Um, and when I sell them, I mean, I have some images. You can still see my desktop. Let's see if this is kosher to go over here and go here and see. Let me see the. So, you know, I have sold, if you can see this, here's a piece that was sold. And this is, I think this is a um, definitely not a glue, a glue work. I work on glue, I work with glue. But um, a work with this material, and what I'll say when this, you know, when Elizabeth bought this and had it framed, it looks to me that she did what I would have done, which is to float it, right? Float it under glass. Um, you know, it's not what I would have done because the top and the bottom, optically, it's it's just proportions are not portions I probably would have chosen, but. Am I going to complain? No, I am not going to complain because, you know, it's out of my hands and also super excited uh, that someone not only um, purchased a work, but um, had it framed. I mean, I can't not love that. And here's one where, where that was sold where someone did mat. They over matted it. 
and I understand why. Like a lot of these pieces, only recently have I figured out how to keep, um, let me go back to the piano. Only recently have I figured out how to keep these flat. Most of the time when I pull them out of my storage, and I have hundreds of these, so they're in boxes, they do curl. But what I've figured out over time is that if you iron the backing paper first, it will curl, and you use that curl against the curl of the object. And then you're going to keep the whole thing a little flatter. I'm not, I, I prefer them floated under because I only, I always work to the edge and I always cut them down to the size that I want them to be. Um, but you know, I haven't exhibited, I've never exhibited this work. Like, as I said before, this is the first time anyone's asked me to talk about this work. Um, and it's not been very, it's been super visible on Instagram, but that's counts for, it counts for a lot because Aaron saw it and here I am, but it's not a path at least it hasn't been for me. It's, it has not been a path um, uh, that has opened exhibition possibilities. I have um, sold some work because people have seen seen work on Instagram and they've corresponded with me and we've and that's worked out really well. It's been lovely. Um, but um, I haven't really had to solve the problem of framing and mounting all of this work. It would be daunting as I think all of you would probably, I'm just putting up work because it's fun for me to see things, um, even this way. Uh, you can all understand it'll be daunting to frame everything and to fill a space because they're not big. These are huge for me, which is, you know, 11 by 17, um, but they're still small. Um, and I've made smaller works, so you know the smallest things I have are probably less, even less than eight and a half by eleven. Other questions or concerns? If not, I'm just going to sit here and show you some stuff too, just to pass the time because it's fun. Is there anything in the chat that I should look at? One person did uh, want to know if you start out with a plan or an idea. I think I start out with, um, Definitely with an idea, but not so much with a plan. So, for example, um, I'm going to show you this. Um, I made this the other day, which was just me making paintings, right? And I'm making paintings. I'm not going to try to play it because I think Zoom wouldn't handle that. I'm like starting with a blank sheet of paper. I spray water on it and put dump acrylic medium on it. I use a brayer to you know load up load up the paint. And then I finally, to conclude it, run, run a, um, a squeegee over it that I've designed, built myself. And once I have this, I then can start, I make these because I know that I'm going to be cutting them. Even when they're ones that I really should never have cut because like this, I, again, this is one of those images like that one in the, in the journal where I look at this. And this is vertical, not horizontal, but you know, whatever. Um, I look at this and think, what the hell is that? I haven't seen that before. This makes me really happy. But I did, I, I turned this one into a, um, a painting that I finished the other day. And so the plan, if, if there is a plan, let me try to find that painting. Damn, where is it? If there is a plan, it emerges because I know that I start with this. And recently, the next object that I will have to, to work with will be um, that uh, so something. Uh, 
up like, like this. And I'm working through some ideas then that have to do with um, uh, these organic forms that feel um, sort of interior, but also, like here's a drawing that I haven't gone back to yet. Like I kind of know that I'm working on, like sometimes they end up being portraits or I'm thinking in terms of the interior of the body, sort of building on something I learned from um, uh, Louise Bourgeois, sort of how, like, kind of interior space that's also a psychic space. So the plan is driven by a concept. The plan is driven by the materials. I start with these backgrounds. I make two or three of them. I, you know, I might start working with something like this. And then inside of that is going to go if not, if not this, then once I cut it out, it's going to be something like this, right? Sorry, it's back. Something like that. <clears throat> um, I mean, I don't know if that's satisfying. The the, it's a good question. The question of do I have a plan? I think I have a set of routines. It's like when you sit down to practice a musical instrument. Or if any of you play, like I play guitar badly and don't play it as much as I used to, I will always sit down and start with the same things. I will always like warm up and I'll start with the same things. So I'll come in on a given day and I will begin making these, these paintings because I know that I'm, that I'm making something I want to see. And they feel really good to make, those of you who paint, you know, like the lusciousness of the material. Um, and then I begin to build towards... Um, Oh, that one got away from me. It is twice. Oh, that's why. Um, and then I know I have these th these ideas. I'd like to come back to to this drawing here. Um, I know I have things like this that I'm working out. I know I have surfaces and textures like this. Now, I also because a lot of this isn't the collage material, meaning not from found sources. Um, I'll come in and do a lot of paint a lot of the loops on found materials. I will cut those loops out so they're like those loops that I was working with earlier. Um, here's that. You know, I'll I'll end up in a place like this, where this is this isn't finished. This is still very much in the. I have to keep cutting into this. Um, there are found materials. There's that painting in the background. Um, there, there's the in, outside, inside of an object that has that kind of interior psychic something for me. It's part of a personal, some personal iconography, if I can still say things like that. Um, I mean, I, there, there's a lot of that kind of personal iconography around in the studio. Little things like this, um, things like this, things like this and this, you know, th things that I want to look at um, and keep keep thinking about the loops and the guts and the meat and the drips and fluids and stuff like that. So why am I talking about that? Because I was asked a question about ideas and and plans. So my I'm prepared to want to see certain things and develop my iconography. I have a set of habits for making, for working on surfaces. Um, and when the habits sometimes call for formal solutions that draw upon that personal iconography, I, I begin to elaborate on that. I have a question. Please. Okay, so with your transfer paper, do you fuse? Yes. The, I know, your quick question. No, 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 it's, it's the news I brought. This is the only news I think that matters. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Do you fuse the, the, the substrate to the transfer paper on each of the substrates and then put them together? Yes. Does that make sense? Okay, that's all uh, I needed to know. That's it. You yeah, you, you can't, because I'm always layering, I'm building up layers this way. I'm sorry, this way. Every layer has to have silicone on the bottom. Thank you. That's what I needed. 
<laughs> and thank you for asking, Sharon, because that's like one of those questions I didn't know. That like, yeah, it's a good question, and I didn't even think that um, think about it. But yeah, you every every um, bit of the material, and you can't paint over it. Like sometimes I have paint leak around. You gotta. It has to be pure, and then there is a step, unfortunately. Yeah. So here, let me get this close. This shiny stuff is when the silicone begins to spill over an edge, and I have to sit here at, when I'm finished and rub it off. And fortunately, it doesn't. It comes off very easily. But the last step in any process is to hold these things up to the light, find where that stuff is, because sometimes I will squeegee varnish over, a matte varnish or a varnish that's loaded with a little bit of pigment, because I want the edges of things to have that sitting inside, like, um, like in this one, there's the little orange in there. That's because the last step of this one was varnishing, varnishing with a little bit of orange, because I wanted the white edge of the paper that's cut to hold a little bit of color. Um, and if I don't, if I don't rub that residue of the silicone off, the paint will not stick. It'll like, it'll beat up or it'll just roll off the next time anyone touches it. So I always have to do that. More, more and more I'm avoiding, var I'm, I'm not, I have an ambivalent relationship to these varnishes and the squeegee varnishes. Anyway, thanks, Sharon. Other questions? Is everybody being shy? They're all they're all now on the Blue Heron website, and they're all buying rolls of. Like, I should write to them because tomorrow <laughs> they're going to have like the biggest order they've ever had. And be careful; they do run out. Because I think that you no, know, they have no competitor as far as I know. So be careful, you know, buy it now. Like, and I should, I should never have told you about it because I'm never going to get any more myself. But I have a very big role. Yeah. So these are, you know, this is just pieces that have not been. This is often the way I start working. I will just like have all of these cutouts, and I'll sit here and see if there's something that's finally interesting. Um, and then things I have. So, do you hand cut all those? I do. Um, I, hmm. I hand cut them all. Um, um, can I? I'd love to mention a, a whole like set Zippy, of work. My wife, please. Yes. A you. whole set of work that's conceptually related, but looks really different. Because back in the day, you used to do basically the same concept, but layering things between sheets of glass and then bolting oh. all the glass together. Yeah. They were these huge, like chunky, heavy, they were still collage, but it was also without, it was collage without glue, but uh, in a very different way. And if you have any of those images, it might be fun for people I, to see what those look like. I was looking at a few things today um, that were in this weird uh, book that was published about the work that Gene and I do together like very old, this is a collage probably from the 1988. I mean, very old things out of latex. But then they think that one of those is in here, Vicki. Oh, drawings from 1980s. These are really big. Back when I was just working with charcoal and and um, uh, charcoal and graphite and white chalk and, and sculpture. But wait, I think there's it's another one from that same book from the 80s. Yeah, so there's one. <sighs> yeah, um, I'm sorry, I'm launching Photoshop. So this is eight or 10 sheets of glass. Each layer holds punched paper. And there are many, many layers that you look through to see this image or to not see this image. Um, and this is from 1990, maybe one or two. Um, but there, you know, there's a lot of older artwork. And this is a, yeah, this is a really big one. Um, I don't know why it's on its side. Image, rotation, clockwise. This was um, 
huge sheets of glass with ladders that have been cut from aluminum foil layered between the glass, but very old. I wouldn't say that it's, it's not that it's immature. It's just like I feel a lifetime ago. And Vicky, do you have any idea what happened to this? I think this just got taken apart. No, no idea. It was beautiful, but I don't know, no, what, you know what became we, of it. We've all made beautiful things that are gone. Um, this is gone. This was really tall. It was maybe five feet tall and yeah. Um, yeah, that was very heavy. I'm looking at the thing. 110 pound heavyweight paper, correct? Seeing what weight, yeah. It's, um, uh, I mean, if you want to know exactly what kind of paper it is, um, this is so weird. Here I am, like, in, in my orders. <laughs> I think I buy this stuff all the time. Um, it's this stuff. And it's really good, this Niha paper, really good stuff. I like it. It's not, for those of you who are purists and spend a lot of time painting and doing ink drawing and work with really good papers, I go through so much. I'm kind of a cheapskate. But this stuff, um, it holds up. Uh, it's not, do, do any of you know the technical term for what happens when the paper gets wet and it begins to pill if you rub on it? You know, it's like, it's not the kind of stuff that's gonna hold up to really, really deep scrubbing, but, um, but, I, but it works really well for me. Anything else? Just one last question. Did you cut Please. the scrolly part out? I mean, did, did you did you draw the scrolly part and and hand cut all of that? Are you talking about in the image we're looking at now? This? Yeah, this, the the yeah, the all loop. that is yeah. That starts that starts as something like this. Okay. And so what I'll do is I'll I'll fuse the silicone to the back. I'll peel the backing paper off, and then I will first cut the contour, and then I will go in. Um, and if you look carefully here, you could see that I'm always cutting into the paint on one side and into the white, into the white on the other. Because when I do that, when I cut into the paint on one side, into the white on the other, it gives it depth, mm. right? And it gives it a sense of, of roundness. That's my hope. Maybe it's not working, but that's my hope. My hope is that it, um, gives it a sense of roundness and it works really it's really effective on and I don't have one to show you That's right here anyway. Oh, yeah I do. <clears throat> With uh, the drawings that are more um, um, Rectilinear like this You can really like build some depth into the into that lattice it, it has depth because of the when you cut into the darkest part on one side and into the white on the other, it looks like it's light and shadow to my eye. That's what I've, that's what I've discovered as I do these. So here, what looks completely flat, once I cut into the red and into this blue, I will, get, I will achieve a little bit of depth. Mm. Um, I've tried to do this with you know, for those of you who'd like magazine work, you know, tried to do this with an image, but I just am not satisfied with the way it works. You know, maybe it's something like, so instead of working with an ink drawing, do that on the back of, of a photograph or a magazine print and then cut out the same kind of lattice. But somehow it just doesn't feel, I don't know, I, I lose a sense of that depth and roundness that I get when I do this uh, in this kind of lattice work or this in the what you called scroll work right um, can I uh, uh, this is another like dumb process question or not dumb but just specific because I uh -huh. don't understand can I ask it uh, yes as long as you as long as you realize that now we're going to start looking like a a horse, a horse and pony show. So well, but I'm asking because I've never understood what you're. Uh, how you uh, do yeah. it. So you said you 
peel you you attach the transfer paper and then you peel it and then you cut correct and is that is that you peel it because if you didn't peel it it would be too thick to cut like um, why not cut and then peel it off before you fuse it okay so because wouldn't the I'm, I'm wondering why the back once you've peeled it doesn't the trend the back the whatever the stuff is that's going to heat up doesn't it like stick to things and get dust and hair it in doesn't. it that's what's so beautiful about it it doesn't pick up anything no. a, that, and there are three reasons one if you leave the backing paper on that backing paper um tends to curl everything and i like working flat and when the when the silicone is really fused onto the back of a piece of paper or to a, on, onto a magazine page um it really lies flat because it's got a little bit of extra weight it just lies flat and the third reason <clears throat> Is that once you put it on the on your and i hope all of you have it's like an essential tool um a self-healing mat to cut on if you those of you working with knives they come in all sorts of forms but they, it's really important to have have good ones because it's the only way to, when you're working with a knife um to cut and not have the knife jump on something i i push really hard i'm i'm all of my carpal tunnel, all of my elbow pain comes from like bearing down as I'm really cutting, cutting into the mat. Um, you really want to go deep because the mat's going to keep everything running under this equal pressure. And when you put um, a piece of material down that has, I'm sorry, I'm looking for one. When you put a piece of material down that has um, backing on it, it's not going to slide. It sticks to it, it. It has some grip without that, without it ever picking up dust or anything. Right. So it's not sticky. Um, I have worried that if I take things in my car, uh, they are going to melt and therefore fall apart if it's ever hot. So those of you in Atlanta, where it is actually hot, as opposed to we uh, weak people in Philadelphia, if you leave something in the car, it's going to delaminate. It's going to come apart because the iron does not have to be that hot to fuse the layers. You should experiment with that. I think I keep my iron on. Um, I mean, what do I know? Um, uh, God, it's like. On, on like barely a synthetic, like that trans from synthetics to wool. I just, I don't want, I don't want to burn anything. Um, and you can, I mean, one thing I've learned is that, that let's say I've, let's say I've, I've um, put the, the material onto this um, with, and use the iron. Then I want to use a, a um, it's going to be buried under all this stuff. Then I'm going to use um, not a squeegee. You know, I assume all of you have something like this that's harder, where you can really like press. It's going to be hard plastic, not silicone like this, because you want to make sure that it's all off the transfer paper and onto the the paper you're transferring it onto, and and then you can peel it once it's cool. Peel it, and then it then you can just toss it around like I'm tossing around so much in here, you know, that's got that stuff on it. Other thoughts or questions? I've had this guy around for two years. What am I going to do with him? He's really cute. He's got a really cute edge, but I can never find the right thing to do with him. I, I, I probably put him on everything I do. That looks kind of cool, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Because I, I like this, but you know what I mean. Like this is, and it's a one-way street with the with the fusing, as it is with glue. You really don't want to put it on something you you want to take it off of. Thoughts? Um, question, John. The yes. I, number one, I'm really enjoying your collages, even Thank more you. seeing your process and being able to see the textures of them. This is really great. Thank you. Please. Um, you okay. talked about putting the um, varnish on like an orange varnish to pick up the white of the edges is that coloring the whole 
cover of your, are you leaving an orange tint over the whole massage or are you, how does that work? <clears throat> well, um, I tend to put in so little acrylic. I'm, us I'm usually tinting um, a, a, a gloss varnish. You know, I'm just like using this and a little bit of water and, and barely like, so maybe, God, I can't believe I'm gonna use these measurements. Like maybe two or three tablespoons of varnish and maybe a little bit, uh, a couple sprays of water. Um, and then not even a, not even more than a pea, less than half a pea of, let's say, you know, let's say a, um, a red, this is a naphthol, a uh, crimson, um, or a gold and mix them. And if I use a, only a little bit, then there's no, it's not, and I think in the piece that I showed you, you do not, it does not look as though it has an orange cast because I do not want that. Um, I do not want an orange cast and everything. However, um, I only get one shot at it because if I do it again, acrylic dries so fast that it will then build up in ways that I don't want. So I've had to, I've had to work hard to make it <clears throat> not stain. And if there's too much, like there's some staining, there's a little bit of staining in here. You can see that that's going orange, right? If the, if the under surface, like this surface, which is, which is magazine surface, um, it will not hold anything. But if it's bare paper like this and it's not already has paint on it, then it'll pick up the tint. So I have to be very careful. Um, I'm really not aiming to give a to give a tint to everything. I'm only aiming to um, soften the edges and give them a little bit of color. With the recent stuff, like this piece, I am not doing anything to it, which means I'm going I'm living with I'm living with some like edges that are just going to be there. Um, some of them are white, some aren't. Um, but because the paintings that I'm working from, I'm doing so much staining, uh, like in the, in that, um, quick time movie I showed you, like when I'm putting so much ink on here, um, black ink that when I finally do my final, um, my final, final draw, that ink is all the way through the paper. So when I cut that edge, isn't going to be white. It's going to be black. So I've thought about that a lot. I've, or I've experimented a lot with what to do with the edges. It's, it's always a frustration I have, but I'm not, but I do love paper and I love what happens when paper butts up against paper. And I love, you know, I love, um, to come back to my camera, you know, I love, I love when, when I, because of the weaving that I'm doing, what happens when one surface has been freed from another with a cut and is on top of something that it should really be under? I mean, I don't know how else to say it. I'd have to, I'd have to build this for you with you in the room to sort of say what's really going on here. But, um, and I'm not sure it's worth me going into detail about, but, um, but yeah, I think about I think about those edges a lot, and I'm I'm almost at peace with the way things end up looking. I'll put one more down. Yeah, this makes me happy. Those are very nice, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, beautiful. Very interesting. Appreciate that. Other thoughts? See, my, my hope was that y'all would tell me what I'm doing. Like, because because I don't, I kind of know, but I kind of, like, we're all too close to our own work. I mean, I am sometimes surprised by what, my Instagram always surprises me. Like, this one. I, I just, okay, then I'll shut up. I think I've probably gone on too long. I think I put, yeah, I put this one up today and thought, everyone's going to love this. And this is like so underloved. No one loves this. 
like, just like no one's loving this. It's like made me so happy to make, but you know, that's my daughter likes it. Thank you, Celeste. Um, but you know, but you can't, you can't tell, you can't tell what's going to be loved sometimes. Um, like why this one? It's because it's because Jackie Onassis is in there. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Maybe the algorithm sees Jackie and tells people to love this. And you know, I love this from a journal. Like this made me really happy to find again. Like, oh, that's pretty good for me. This is like, oh, there's there's a lot going on in there for me. Um yeah, I'm into that. But then things, you know, things take off. Like this one to me was really ugly for a while, but it has gotten a lot of love. So I've got to think about what that is. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the uptake and how people receive this stuff. I haven't had many opportunities to show it um, in any other form than uh, through social media. I've had some studio visits and have people come. I have boxes and boxes of stuff. I was supposed to this summer have a, um, a student um, come and uh, help me figure out what things are in what boxes. We probably all have this problem. Like, I've got all this work. I, can, I have scans of everything. But I, if someone asks me to go put my hands on something, on the actual object, I have to plow through a, you know a dozen boxes each of which has a hundred things in them and that's embarrassing <laughs> fun but it's embarrassing and I, I you know I wanted some help to do that anyway y'all have been marvelous I don't want to um, take your whole evening I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to y'all well, well, we appreciate what you've done for us because this has been a real good eye opener, I think, for everyone. Uh, your technique yeah. is different than anything we've seen before, and and I think we all have have something we can take away from this. Um, so, thank you very, very much for doing this and for spending so much time with us. We appreciate that. And Cynthia, feel free to circulate my email if people have follow-up questions, especially about working with the uh, silicon um, pa paper of, and fusing material and the technique. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to do my best anyway to respond to, to concrete questions about like, how, you know, how to use it well, but get enough that you can experiment and not feel worried about, uh, about using it. Cause it's, it is, it has changed the way that I work. It doesn't change the kind of images that I think with, but it's changed my ability to, to realize particular kinds of images once I do think of them, which then opens new gateways, so. Sure, wonderful. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. You're welcome, thank you all, I appreciate thank it. Thank you, we, we appreciate everything you've done. Thanks, good night, y'all. Good night. Bye-bye. Oh. Stop recording, yes.